Hey guys, we're sitting here in the dark, as you can tell. Our lights have gone off. So we're starting it on just a few minutes early, hoping we can get people on before we start. So this is just a little preliminary. We aren't starting for two to three minutes. I'm also gonna start Zoom. So those that want to be on Zoom, can do so. I think everybody's having storms, so if it turns out that we can't do this right now, um, I'll do the lesson uh, somehow and put it on YouTube. Ah, there's some light. Let there be light. Hey, that's great. Okay. Now it's not light. Oh, there you go. We've got a little bit of light here. <laughs> I look a little bit like I could put a flashlight under my chin and be spooky. Okay, let's see. Um, I don't know why I'm not seeing my screen. Okay, let's see. I've already invited others. I've already. Hey, John. I, for some reason, I have an O here. I'm going to start the video. There you go. Now it should. John, you know I'm sitting in the dark, and, and I know you can't see me, but you'll be able to hear me. Hey, Kana. Hey, Sherry. They're on Facebook. Oh, there's the light. So we may One minute. be able to actually do this tonight, guys. We're going to give it still a minute or two while people are trying to get on and, and dealing with their own problems. So y'all just bear with us. Can you get it up on your computer? Yeah. Yeah, okay. We're doing something different today, Kana. You'd be thrilled to know we are being a little more techy. Well, how, do I, how do I mute this? Uh, you just turn the volume down on your computer. Well, yeah. It didn't work. Oh, that didn't work. No. Hang on a second, guys. We still have one minute for starting. It's bigger than what it is on your phone. I mean, oh. you're not over there, you know. Oh, I know, but that's just a recording. <laughs> okay, there we go. That's what now that is. You, are... you want to come sit here? Because you'll be the one that to okay. start. Okay, I'm fixing to turn it over to Jim, and we're going to get started in about 20 seconds. What's that noise? I don't know. Somebody. What's that what background noise that you were doing? Yeah. Should I take my gum out? That's up to you, baby. I'm watching you. Is that Joan? Yeah, that's Joan. Okay. Okay. Ready? Yeah, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, glad y'all are, are with us. We may lose power. It's pretty dark outside. I'm, we're over here in... Uh, Evergreen, so uh, you know, actually Travis Bridge, Alabama. Welcome to Travis Bridge, Alabama, on the Sepulchre River. Population of 16. It was 17 when Kane was here, but now it's 16. So this week, got just two birthdays. On Tuesday, Donnie Max has a birthday. I don't, I'm not going to say exactly how old he is, will be, but he did, I am sure, get AARP mailings for the last week and for the rest of his life, he'll get those. Something about half a century, something like that, I don't know. Anyway, his birthday is on, it sounds old, doesn't it? It does. Half a century. Mm. And also, Sherry Scott, I see you on here. Yeah, there you are. Is uh, have a birthday on Saturday. You know, there's a certain age where you're supposed to um, have to get on, you know, one of these government programs. Sherry is not at that point yet, but it seems like the government thinks that she is. She needs to check her <laughs> birth certificate. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, just kidding. Love you, Sherry Scott. And you too, Donnie. Um, don't forget, 
Um, we um, this Tuesday is vote day for the runoff if you're in Alabama. Um, and it should be a very low attendance, but if you happen to go no matter what, please be safe, wear your mask, and maybe even want to wear gloves. I don't know. Just be safe and social distance. And before I, turn, before I pray and turn it over to Ann, I want to mention we have put a new song on Facebook, on our Area 51 Facebook song that you, I think you'll like. It's by um, Molly Skaggs, and she is the daughter of Ricky Skaggs. And uh, <coughs> boy, she, she can sing. What's the song again? Uh, lay my body by me. No. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's um, Molly Skaggs along with Methyl, Bethel Music, and, and you'll like it. It's a live version. Um, so anyway, let me just uh, start to have a word of prayer, and we'll turn it over to Ann. Father God, thank you for this time we have together. Thank you for our uh, friends and family that are watching, and all of our uh, family, everybody that's watching this family. I just pray you watch over them. Help us even right now as we're uh, going through some storms here. Uh, Thank you that you're, you're in control and you'll, you'll, take, you'll, you'll give us what we need, and we appreciate that. I just pray you'll speak to us now, speak through and to us, and help us have the, the ears to hear and the eyes to see and the hearts to understand what you say as we continue to talk about our spiritual gifts. Help us each one to realize that we have a spiritual gift, and if we're not using it, it's to the, uh, the church could be a lot better if we did. So use us now, speak to us now, and speak through and in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, you want to say something? Hi, guys. Um, yeah, that's a little lacking. Tell them about um, if any prayer requests are sent to you. Uh, if y'all have any prayer requests, um, send it to my phone. Uh, Jim, we are using Jim's phone to broadcast on Facebook, so it's hard to get them off of there. So if you'll send them to our phone or send them to Gaina, and she'll make sure we get them before the end of the lesson. So I hope everybody's doing well. I know we're all kind of sitting in storms and a lot of us don't even have any power. Uh, so, and ours has been going in and out. So if that happens, it happens and it'll be all right. But I appreciate y'all joining us today. Let's have a question for you. Have you ever heard of the online encyclopedia called Newpedia? Probably not. Uh, it was conceived in 2000 by a couple of guys named Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger and its goal was simple contract the best and brightest doctors, historians, and professors from all around the world to research and write scholarly articles, which, upon completion, would be filtered through an extensive editing process and then uploaded to an online site. Due to the nature of the task, though, the project was extremely slow, and it caused the two owners to really unplug the servers after three years with only 24 articles posted to the web and 74 others in the review stage. Now, a year later, Wells and Sanger launched a second vehicle for the purpose of creating a feeder system for Newpedia. This subsequent venture adopted a different strategy. Average, ordinary men and women were encouraged to submit articles to the same editorial staff. For example, an avid golfer could submit an article about golf. Likewise, a football fan could write an article about his favorite team with stats, schedule, names of players and coaches. By the end of its first year, volunteers had submitted 20,000 wiki articles for consideration. At the time of this writing, 19 years later, Wikipedia is the largest encyclopedia on the World Wide Web. The English Wikipedia, and realize it's in multiple languages, but just, as, just the English version has 6,118,772 articles. 39,457,566 registered editors and 136,332 active editors. So, what's the difference? What's the difference between Newpedia and Wikipedia? How did they do it? Well, what they did was they got ordinary individuals involved and they entrusted them with the task of researching, compiling, and submitting articles pertaining to topics they were passionate about. Well, I'm not suggesting that Wikipedia is uh, a completely accurate or reliable, but I just want you to notice that volunteers created it. Uh, volunteers created the most widely accessible encyclopedia on the, on the planet. Tragically, for souls and the cause of Christ, many churches and ministries operate under the Newpedia model rather than the Wikipedia model. 
only accredited professional believers are enlisted to lead discipleship groups or mission efforts, while the rest of the members sit by idly watching others do what God has commissioned them to do. St Steve Merrill, in his book, Wiki Church, offers this challenge. Imagine if the situation were reversed. Imagine if every believer, not just paid leaders, were engaged in ministry. That's a wiki church. That's the book of Acts. What a neat, neat idea. There's really no greater endeavor than advancing Christ's kingdom through the church. And God equips all of us. He equips and trains believers to accomplish that endeavor, not to promote ourselves, but to promote unity within the church. Now, we have been studying Ken Hemphill's book on spiritual gifts called You Are Gifted for the last several weeks. And Hemphill writes about what Paul told various New Testament churches uh, about spiritual gifts. And we've already studied what he's told the Corinthians and the Thessalonians and the Romans. Today, we're going to look at what he tells the Ephesians. Paul wrote the Ephesians because of heresy. The believers in that church were being pressured to conform to the beliefs and practices of pagans in their area and Jewish neighbors. Uh, we can kind of relate to that, can't we? Do you ever feel any pressure to state your belief as being something that other than what it is because of pressure? From your neighbors or maybe you just don't state what you think because you just don't want to take the heat um, well they were being pressured in the church of, of Ephesus and Paul was trying to help them out and, and what he says is that for the church to function properly uh, that they have to overcome pressure from pagans and they have to have doctrinal integrity in order to do that now spiritual gifts are not simply related to the effective ministry they are intricately related to the total life of the church. We are to walk worthy of this life, and that means that it is vitally important for us to be unified in common belief and practice. Of course, that includes getting along with others. We have to learn to live harmoniously, first and foremost, as members of the same family. Now, I'm going to go down to Ephesians 4 and read the first three verses. So if you all go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ephesians, we're going to begin with Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 3. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We've talked about unity throughout this study. In this passage, the description of a worthy walk begins with bearing with one another in love. Love has the power to overcome dangers that are inherent in human relationships. Let's face it, humans aren't easy to get along with. As a matter of fact, Hemphill says that community living is difficult and tolerance or tenacity is required. I think that's interesting. Note that he isn't saying that loving people in the church community will be easy. He's saying it requires tolerance and tenacity. In other words, it isn't all fun and sunshine. But community living is required. We can't give up on each other. Living in community requires certain attitudes, humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, and love. And guess where those come from? They're attitudes that are fruits of the Spirit, aren't they? Now look back at Ephesians 2, and let's go to verses 8 through 10. Because Paul's going to remind us of something. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You can't produce these virtues without, with human effort. That's what this verse is saying. Living in community is so difficult, it requires attributes that can only be produced by the Spirit. And you can try to be humble, but you'll either become frustrated with your inability to do so or become proud because you are so humble. You can try to be patient, but then you will be anxious about your inability to be patient. We soon become discouraged in our inability to change our old nature. These virtues are the work of the Spirit, and they come through surrender, not effort. Now, go back to Ephesians 4. We're going to complete the lesson in Ephesians 4. Let's look at verse 2 again. 
In this verse, Paul defines walking in a worthy manner, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, these character traits were intended to combat arrogance, harshness, and intolerance in personal relationships. These virtues are of paramount importance for a gifted community to properly function. When you can see that, we're not going to function right if we're all harsh and arrogant and we're intolerant. In order for us to function, we have to be humble and gentle. We have to have patience and we have to bear with one another. Paul emphasizes this in every passage about gifts. Harmonious relationships are central to the proper functioning of the gifted body. Humility, you know, is a distinctly biblical virtue. The Greeks didn't really think a whole lot about humility. Uh, the Greeks thought that humility was a sign of weakness. Biblical humility, humility is the opposite of complacency, conceit, and self-exaltation. It's when you see yourself as you really are. The proper assessment of yourself based on the understanding of your total dependence on God. When you properly evaluate your giftedness, you are not arrogant and you are not self-pitying. Instead, you are able to be gentle in your relationships with others and effective in your ministry to the King. Humility, gentleness, and patience are divine attributes, practical expressions of love, which enable believers to persevere or to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Love in all of its practical expressions must govern the Christian life and specifically personal relationships in the body. So to work together, we have to be unified. Unity is a gift of the Spirit, but it must be maintained by gifted members working in harmony. Once again, we see this thought, and it's kind of a mystery, that you have divine sovereignty, but you also have human freedom. And human freedom means that we have to work toward maintaining um, our harmony in, in our church. Now let's look at verses four through six. Um, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to be one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, Hemp Paul says that these verses present, Hemp Hill, I'm not sure what I just called him, but Hemp Hill says that these verses present a sevenfold expression of unity and that it is one of the most eloquent compositions in all of Scripture. Now, one body refers to the church as the body of Christ. One spirit is the Holy Spirit that indwells believers and gives unity. One hope of your calling means the hope we get when we respond to Christ. The next three expressions, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, remind his readers of the moment they confessed Jesus as Lord and were baptized. Now he concludes in verse 6 with a reference to God, whose essential oneness is the basis for the unity of his people. God himself is the basis and the source of our unity. Ephesians was written to combat false teaching. The goal of gifted ministry is the unity of the faith, which in turn is linked to doctrinal stability. Unity is a gift of God and it's mediated by the Spirit. So what is our role in this? Well, in Ephesians 4.3, Paul says that the church needs to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. While we can't create unity, we can and we must make every effort to preserve it by using our gifts for the edification of others and the church. Now, let's look at verses 7 through 10. Ephesians 4, 7 through 10. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says... When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. In verses 7 and 8, Paul is focusing on the exalted Lord as the giver of gifts. Christ gives gifts to men and women, and then he gives those gifted people to the church. Isn't that a neat thought? He gives people gifts, and then he gives those people to a church. I love that. Um, we live in a world that is inundated by false teaching that would make the church of the exalted Lord only one among many options for spiritual truth. The world desperately needs, the world desperately needs to see the fullness of God displayed in and through the church today. 
Amen to that. In this passage, Paul is emphasizing Christ's dominion over all powers and his consequent filling of all things through the church. The total sufficiency of the exalted Lord who has equipped the church for every ministry by giving gifts to men. So members of the church are not members of an insignificant church. We are not insignificant. Uh, we're part of a universal church, fully equipped by the Lord of the universe to reach all nations with the necessary message that he is their rightful king. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ and he fills heaven and earth. The truly astounding and exciting news is that this fullness is only experienced on earth through us, his body, the church. Let's move on to verses, four, uh, verses um, 11 and 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of the church. Now, all members are equally gifted and equally important to the growth of the church. Leaders have gifts that help them or that enable them to assist others in the discovery of their gifts and in the development of their gifts and in the use of their gifts. In other words, trained staff members help other church members accomplish ministry. The work of the church belongs to all of us though. You know, in the early church, there wasn't any distinction between laymen and clergy. The appointment of clergy happened in about AD 250 because of false doctrine being taught as the gospel expanded into pagan lands. An early church leader at the time, Cyprian of Carthage, thought that at that time that, that appointing leaders would give leadership to the churches and kind of guard against false doctrine. However, the clergy laity distinction is not biblical. The Bible does not even remotely suggest that there is only one class of Christians who can be trusted to interpret and apply his truth. Christ expected that all of us would help spread the gospel. Expecting the pastor to do it all is like expecting a CEO of a company to be the only one that talks to customers. Or a hospital where the only, only the chief administrator sees patients. Or a football team where only the quarterback touches the ball. It was never God's plan that a small minority would do the mission of the entire church. Jesus gave his charge. You will be my witnesses to all of us. The pastor does have unique leadership functions by the virtue of his gifts, one of which is equipping other gifted members for the work of service. Being gifted to do something is not enough. You have to develop your gift so it can be used effectively, and the pastor helps us with that so that we can help build the kingdom and fulfill the Great Commission. The gift list in this passage has a twofold message, or a twofold emphasis, that people are gifted and these gifted people are given to the church. This list is restricted to leadership and teaching functions because of the unique needs created by false teaching. Remember, Paul never used a comprehensive gift list. He tailored each list to fit the needs of the recipients of the letter. He included new gifts in every list. If he had kept writing other letters, he probably would have added gifts in those lists also. Um, God uniquely gifts his church for each new task in ministry as the need arises. Now there's an inextricable link between gifted leaders and gifted members. And it isn't us, us against them. We will never be what God called us to be until we understand that we are one body gifted by Christ to reach the nations. All of us, Brother Randy, Brother Terry, uh, we are uh, Brother Caleb, all of us, every Sunday school teacher, every child, uh, every deacon, everybody that's a member of the church is to be utilizing their gifts because we're all one body and together we can help reach Christ for the nations, uh, or help, help send Christ or take Christ to the nations. Now the Ephesians Christians were getting pressured to conform to beliefs and practices of pagan and Jewish neighbors. Now Paul painted a picture for them of the proper functioning of the church where each member used his or her gift to advance the kingdom. He insisted that this was essential to doctrinal integrity. Now look at verses 13 and 14. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Uh, he had just talked about how God had equipped the saints for the work of ministry. And now he is saying the purpose of the work is the unity of the faith and spiritual maturity, no longer being deceived by evil schemes and every new doctrine that comes around. We need to be able to be mature enough to tell when something is not spiritually doctrinal. When we're not unified, that disunity creates a vulnerability. It creates a vulnerability to the winds of doctrine. Gifts are not simply related to effective ministry. They are intricately related to the total life of the church. Gifted leaders have the task of equipping gifted members for their unique work of service, with the end result that the body of Christ is built up. The ministry of believers results in building up the body in two directions, the unity of the faith and a full measure of spiritual maturity. Now those two things will enable the body to stand against false doctrine and defeatful, deceitful scheming. When verse 13 says faith, uh, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, it's referring to doctrine in verse 14. Sound doctrine is still the church's mainline defense against heretical influences that threaten its health and growth. For example, some people will say that there is a need for a second baptism of the Spirit after salvation. Christians don't need that. What they need is a more mature knowledge of the Son of God and complete surrender to His fullness. They need to grow in the knowledge of what is already available in Christ, not seek another spiritual experience. The fullness of Christ refers to the completeness already available to the church, which must be attained by the full use of gifts. To be blown about by every wind of doctrine is like a rudderless boat. It's both childish and foolish when one understands that the church has at its disposal the full resources of the risen Christ. Now look down at, at verses 15 and 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Paul concludes this section with an emphasis on our responsibility to participate in the growth of the church and the expansion of the kingdom. We are to grow in every way or in all aspects into Christ. The first part of verse 15 talks about speaking the truth in love. And this is really how the church grows. Spoken truth is absolutely necessary to curb the dangerous winds of false doctrine. But speaking the truth must always be in the context of love. Now in verses 15 and 16, our lesson points out that Paul has four prominent themes of gifted growth. So let's go through those real quick. Number one, the church is empowered to grow because Christ the triumphant king fills it. The empowering, this empowering should rule out all timidity when it comes to mature to ministry. Number two, although growth comes from God, everybody, every member, <laughs> got an extra word in there, every member is fully involved in the process of growth. Muscle power for Christian ministry is supplied by the Spirit, but gifted members are the joints by which the Spirit's power is focused and applied to specific tasks. Number three, unity of the Spirit is necessary for diversely gifted members to work together for a common goal. One member alone can't accomplish much, and when one member fails to function, the whole body is hampered in its kingdom impact. And, proper and number four, proper implementation of gifts must always take place in the context of love. The fullest expression of any gift has no spiritual value when love is abs absent. Robert Coleman says this, when we ask, how many ministers does your church have? The traditional answer is one or two or five, depending on how large the paid staff is. But the true answer is 200 or 2,000, depending on how large the membership is. Every believer is a minister. Or when we ask, where is your church? The traditional reply is on the corner of Broad and Main. That is where the headquarters building is, or we'd say 165 Old Salem Road. But if it is 11 a.m. Tuesday, 
then my church is in room 511 in the professional building where Bill White, Christian attorney, is practicing law. It is at 3009 Melody Lane where Jane White, Christian housewife, is making a home. It is at Central High where Jimmy White, Christian student, is studying to the glory of God. There is the church in action. So what Paul is saying here is he's trying to lift the concept of ministry into the daily life of mothers, factory workers, clerks, soldiers, farmers, students, all of us. Every Christ-honoring vocation becomes a means of service in every location, a place of witness. And that's all I have, and I'm going to turn it back over to Jim for the final 10 minutes to do some um, prayer requests. Well, I know y'all are having, some of y'all are having some problems with the internet, with Facebook because of the storms, and this will be up afterwards if you want to come back and look at it all without introduction, inter, interruptions, I hope. do have several prayer requests I want to go over real quick. First of all, um, Mike and Valerie Bronze are traveling back from Illinois tomorrow. You know, she, they went, went yesterday, and they're coming back tomorrow. A quick trip from them visit with her sister, but primarily because her go to a funeral for her best friend. So be, uh, pray for them as they travel. Uh, Dennis McKinley and Sheila Wiggins both still recovering from their neck surgery. We saw um, Dennis this week and Kim, and uh, he's still having a lot of pain, but he's, he's getting out walking. He looked pretty good. And, and the doctor told him, that he, he did talk to the doctor um, and said that he was going to have some pain like that. The surgery's only been a, half, you know, a week and a half. But he did tell me that the tingling in his shoulder, whichever, I don't know if I can remember if it was right or the left, but wherever the, the tingling was all going down his arm, is not there. That's why he had the surgery. So they're thinking it went, uh, it was successful. So that's a praise and uh, you just gotta get, pray for a quick recovery and the pain to get less and less every day. And I'm assuming the, uh, the same thing for Sheila. We, we saw um, Jerry briefly, week before last, and uh, and I know, and she sends a lot of car too, so she's she's recovering also. Joe Hugener has a uh, follow-up meeting this Friday, I think, on the 17th, with his doctor, and uh, so I know he's getting better. And but hopefully they uh, they they may do a, C, a CT scan. They may not, depending on what what it looks like. But uh, uh, and I know he's he's recovering too. So play for him. Also, Billy Garner on Friday, the 17th has a teleconference doctor's appointment where they'll be contacting him. So be praying for him and also Sheila, she's still recovering from her foot, trying to go through just shots instead of having the surgery there. Uh, let's see, Linda Dunham has a follow-up with her lung doctor one day this month, I think, or maybe in August. I haven't got the date on that yet. Um, I also want to lift Kane up to you. She's still having problems with her neck and uh, not as bad. Um, but uh, I think she has finally agreed to get I do the um, PT physical therapy here in town or there in Monroeville, uh, possibly acupuncture. And uh, so, but you know, she's, she's not letting her slow her down. So that's good. We all also want to remember. Uh, Last week I met you, met, mentioned a person to you that I could not mention yet that had the COVID-19. I can mention him now. Is Scott Allen. He was tested positive, but he hadn't shown any symptoms, but he happened to be uh, quarantined uh, at least for another week at his house. Uh, he just That's had a grand, grandbaby. He just had a new, brand new grandbaby this week or well, the end of last week, and he was able to see that grandbaby, grand, grandson um, this week at a distance. So pray for Scott and Scott is the um, you know he's also he's a pastor also down at Rocky Hill Baptist and he also does maintenance work at, um, at Monroe Manor and I, I'm not sure I'm not gonna say that's where he got the where you know but it could be I mean we get it wherever we don't know where we get it from but um, but pray for him he's more than just a maintenance man there he goes in there with those um, clients and prays with them I've, I've seen him myself 
he'll go in there with me when I visit sometimes, and, and, and he'll be he'll already be in there praying with some people. And I've seen, I know what he does. He's more than just a maintenance man. He's a chaplain and uh, very valuable to those the people that stay there. And speaking of the people that stay there, Brother Lou Angels was there for a little while. And, of course, if you hadn't heard, she passed away this morning early, so be with that family. That, you know, uh, Tam, uh, David and Tammy Langford, who live there on the same property, and then their, uh, her two sons and their families, and, and uh, Gloria, Gloria Smith and Roxanne Smith are related. I think that was an aunt of Roxanne, uh, sister-in-law of Gloria, and the whole family. Okay, and I also want to mention, uh, in particular, the teachers that we have that are in our class. I mean, we got plenty in the church and el el elsewhere, but those are fixing to start back school, and some have already, you know, still already started back, and never quit. But in particular, um, uh, Melissa Barksdale, uh, Teresa Nipper, Amy Gunter, and I think that's all in our class. If I'm, oh, I think I, I think I just lost Zoom. Sorry about that. How did that happen? Anyway, um, so remember them, and also Kana. She'll be driving a bus, and of course they're not exactly sure what all is going to happen. That won't. I think the school board meets one day this week, um, maybe even Tuesday. That's the voting day, but they are meeting meeting again one day this week. So pray for all them. Also, um, um, you know, everyone that's that's have anything to do with schools, you know, have them to be wise in all the decisions made, put the hedge text around them. And if you heard the, the, our meeting, our service this morning, if you saw our service this morning, Brother Randy's message was really one of the best ones I've heard in, um, in a while. And the song that Terry did was perfect, um, perfect, uh, especially for the Andrews family today. Um, but be, you know, we want to lift up, uplift our staff to you. And if you heard what Caleb said, that they're still discussing what to do with Vacation Bible School. It's scheduled to start next Sunday, right? No, no, Sunday no, week. Sunday week. Sunday week. But we still don't know the details of that, and uh, so just pay. You know, we'll, I said they. I think they said they get it to us through email and phone mail. So, but anyway, uh, also I do want to uh, mention our staff to you who they are. You know, um, of course, Randy. Randy and uh, Missy Breedlove and their four children. You know, three of their kids will be in college this year. Of course, one of them is not in college, but he, he's working at the college at Auburn. So, and then one's going to be in schools, uh, you know, uh, junior high school. Cameron, Caroline, Claire, and Carson; those those four children. Then Terry, and Melissa, their two boys, Evan and Andy, and then Caleb and Elizabeth and their son David. And of course, Stacy Carroll and Je her husband Jeff and their three girls and and son. Uh, put a hedge plan for all, each one of them. So. Um, Anyway, let me uh, let me turn this over in prayer. Cause I mean, let me um, close with a word of prayer and um, just let, we want you to know we love you guys. We're praying for you, and uh, look forward to where we can have face-to-face -face meetings again uh, soon. So, God's in control. He's got this, not us. He's got this. Father God, thank you for this time we've had this tonight, this afternoon. Thank you for the message we heard this morning from uh, Brother Randy and and from Brother Terry and uh, through song and brother caleb through uh, his announcements and he, you could tell for his care for the, the youth and the kids just be with them all watch over them and all their families watch over each one of our family members here that's listening to us and the ones that may hear this later whenever they listen to it uh, and i know there's some that won't that can't be with each one of them uh, all these that have been mentioned uh, we do pray for our staff pray for randy missy and terry melissa and caleb and elizabeth and Pray for our deacons and uh, other leadership in our church. Uh, thank you for blessing us, and I pray that we'll bless you in what we do. Again, thank you for the message we received. And I just pray that we will take it to heart. And remember to always keep you first in everything that we do, and that, um, that the main purpose of us, to, each one of us to have in our gifts is to edify the body of Christ. And if we don't use our gifts, the church is lacking. So, again, help us to know what our gifts are and to use them for you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Amen. Bye. This, bye. Bye. How to turn this off? Just, does this, right on. Does this thing mean this, all of a sudden it popped up like that? Yeah, it's okay. Let's, okay. Let's finish this first.